Good afternoon, hope we're all doing well. Thank you for that introduction, uh, Jackie. And um, hello to the nurses and um, of course the staff. So uh, Matt and I will do a brief presentation on the inequities RPN's experience on the job. We will provide a summary of the findings through the uh, research process and an overview of SCIU's uh, proposed approach for the bargaining process. But first, I will uh, provide a quick uh, overview of SCIU's social justice program and explain the relevant history of oppression and discrimination, the impacts, and why we must do this work. So over the last year, a lot have happened regarding the polarization of racial discrimination, culminating with the murder, the murder of George Floyd that captivated the world and saw protests in many major cities around the globe. More recently, the discoveries of 215 indigenous bodies in Kanloops, British Columbia, and um, 104 that is still being investigated in Manitoba, and the faith-based hate crime murder that happened in London. As a union and a social justice organization, we must do our part. An endeavor we began several years ago at SCIU 2016 International Convention, members passed a resolution proclaiming that in order to win economic justice, we must first win social justice. Since this resolution, SCIU Healthcare has created a social justice program to bolster our union's work in equity and inclusion, to continue to advance our vision of a just society for all working people. The first step, supporting organizational change within SEIU's healthcare programs and departments to effectively implement and promote practices, systems, and behaviors within the organization that are consistent with the principles of the social justice movement. The next step, educating members on key elements of racial justice, equity, and inclusion that promotes the rights of marginalized groups and the historically disenfranchised. The program is focused on building the confidence and skills of members to engage in critical conversations about racism, and especially how it impacts union work, member engagement, and bargaining. Listen, oppression is nothing new. It has, it has existed for 400 plus years deeply rooted in our society since the enslavement of African people and the colonization of indigenous peoples and continues to be perpetuated throughout society and in our workplaces because of systemic and structural forms of exclusions and discrimination through institutions of power. Oppression and inequities come in many forms within the workplace. Disparities in pay, work assignments, workload, and scheduling, and discrimination through prejudice and stereotypes among coworkers and between management and workers. Over the last year, the research team have done some great work on furthering SCIU's understanding about incidences of racial discrimination and inequities experienced by nurses during their daily work routines across Ontario's hospital. And I'll pass it over to Matt to discuss this piece. Matt. Thanks, Ainsworth. And that was a fantastic overview. Um, so uh, Ainsworth laid out what we're gonna be talking about in the presentation. I thought I'd start and give you a bit of insight into some of the research that um, led to or, or sorry, some of the research we've conducted leading up to the central bargaining uh, 2021 round. So some of you may have even participated in the focus groups that we held. We held five across the province of Ontario for hospital members, about 30 members participated. And then we also had uh, follow-up surveys, um, the working conditions RPN survey that I, I'm hoping everybody here filled out. Uh, and then we also had a survey tailored towards uh, service and clerical staff that asked some of the same questions. Um, so 
a lot of our members always ask us, why do you collect demographic information when you're when you're conducting research? And in short, you're going to see how collecting information on you know, how in individuals identify, whether they're ethnicity, their backgrounds, their, their gender. Um, it allows us to break down the information in a way, and then you can assess various groups and, and compare different groups to see how they're impacted differently. So what you're going to see in this presentation is a lot of uh, gender comparisons between members who identify as female RPNs versus male RPNs. Um, so there's two, par two parts to this presentation. Ainsworth is going to take you through some of the member anecdotes from those focus groups we held. And I will talk more about some of the statistics comparing uh, the various types of R RPNs. Uh, and then without further ado, we'll, Ainsworth is going to take us through the current findings uh, from our research to date. Thank you, Matt. So as part of the research, um, some of the findings that we, we, uh, we gather um, or correlate um, was the fact that a lot of workers of color thought that there was a lack of support. And um, some of the statements, um, this is one of them, it reads as follows. What's wrong with you people? It's been like 400 years. Why can't you just get over it? And this is actually a very good question. Um, because in fact, it is 400 years. That is why it's such a challenge. Because it's all woven into our, our, our society uh, through systemic means. And individually, we, we all do a great job you know, in fighting injustice. But we, we, we're still slaves to, um, pardon the pun, we're still um, challenged by the system that we, we still have to um, toe. We toe the line of certain system where we have to follow policies and procedures that actually harms others. Ah, next slide. Management ignores mental health challenges. Um, this part of the comment reads as follows. I'm really depressed. I don't know what to do. I feel like I'm not doing anything right. I started crying and my supervisor asked me if I wanted to resign. First of all, what a prick. Listen, mental health is no joke. And over the last year, as a result of the pandemic, this have actually amplified a lot of these um, impacts on a lot of workers. So this is really unfortunate that we have management that is actually not supporting the worker that is actually keeping many of those workplaces going. Next slide. Management ignores racism. This one reads as follows. You're just going to have to get used to it. Why are you so loud? Why are you so aggressive? Why are you so angry? You know, if, if we're supposed to take out the, 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 the racist aspect out of this statement, it is still a horrible statement to say to anyone. But when you had that racism piece in there, and, and remember the, the, the historical trauma that is attached to racism, you can see how the hurt is even more amplified. This is so unfortunate, but this is why we have the social justice program. A lot of these issues will get um, addressed. It's gonna take a lot of time, but um, it's gonna get addressed in due time. Members forced to modify personality and behavior, behaviors. This is really unfortunate. I think we should be allowed to be who we are, because who, and who we are is what makes us who we are, right? I love that little phrase there. Next slide. Oh, it's a nice one here. And this is the last one, actually, Socio socioeconomic inequities. So a restaurant donated food to the essential workers. We're told we can have leftovers after others have, are done with it. Well, first of all, ill, that's really nasty. I remember working at Sonoma Hospital where those doctors used to have their meetings and folks used to just rush into the room afterwards. That's nasty folks, don't do that. But listen, it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter your job title. Um, everyone deserves the same amount of respect. And this is a lot of respect, disrespect, why those on the upper echelon in the workplace 
thinks something like this is actually okay. I'm gonna kick it back over to Matt to talk about the uh, impacts of gender, uh, the impacts of gender and racial discrimination, Matt. Thanks, Ainsworth. So those are real quotes from our members that participated in the focus groups. It was an incredibly eye-opening experience. And honestly, it just fueled the, fueled the fire for wanting to do right by our members who experience uh, a lack of inclusion or racism or in any sort of inequity within the workplace. So in summarizing some of our uh, findings on impacts of gender and racial discrimination, members reported low productivity, anxiety, lack of dignity, personal modification, and a feeling of low self-worth. Nobody should go to work on a daily basis and experience any of these things, especially some of the uh, things that Ainsworth has covered. Um, it was it was quite the experience. Ainsworth moderated a few of the sessions and I, I'm so happy we did it. It was, the members loved it. Uh, it, it really, we, we tried our best to create a really comfortable environment for everybody and everybody opened up. It was, it was a fantastic experience. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about some of the statistics um, tied in with the, the research we did. These, these come from the Working Conditions RPN survey that about, I think 700 of you or so filled out, you and your coworkers. And uh, sorry, I'm just gonna have to minimize something real quick so I can see, there we go. Gender-based experience. So 90% of our RPNs that we surveyed uh, identify as female. We looked at the experience. Do workers feel like their work environment is inclusive? And we wanted to compare the male and female RPNs, as I mentioned. So 71% of men, male RPNs, uh, feel that their work environment is an inclusive one compared to just 53% of the female RPNs. Physical assault experiences. Female RPNs report they experience, uh, or 65% of female RPNs report they've experienced physical assault compared to just 47% of men. Both numbers, obviously too high, but you can see uh, the gender disparity in some of these statistics. Uh, and then next slide, I, I like to just throw a forewarning in there. Um, we did a comparison of nurses who have experienced sexual assault. I understand we asked all of you this question, but um, it's always safer to put a some forewarning. So, uh, sexual assault, assault experience. One in four RPNs have experienced sexual assault at the workplace compared to their male counterparts who only one in seven male RPNs have experienced sexual assault. So you can see through some of the, the gender comparisons that the male and female experience is quite different. And the, the statistics across the board are high, but um, when you look at, through, look at them comparing the two genders that members report, um, it's pretty disheartening and we have a lot of work to do. So what are we going to do about it? Um, obviously we're, we have some fairly robust uh, violence proposals going forward and protections in the workplace uh, for central hospitals. But this is one that we crafted based on the findings of the focus groups and the research to date through those working condition surveys. And we want to address equity and inclusion at the bargaining table. So our proposal is to, develop an employment equity committee. It's actually called uh, equity, and anti an equity and anti oppression committee. So this committee would have a mandate. Uh, their mandate is to eliminate discriminatory practices and systemic barriers to equal opportunities across the hospitals. We want to see fair representation for Aboriginal and Indigenous peoples, persons with disabilities, racialized workers, LGBTQ plus workers, and women, of course. So some of the training topics uh, as part of our proposal, and, th and the interesting thing is part of this proposal, it's not just to limit to training for you and your coworkers. We're going to be pushing at bargaining that supervisors and managers also take this training. I think it's incredibly important that you, your coworkers, and your supervisors do this training alongside one another. Um, everybody needs it. Clearly, as you can see in the anecdotes that Ains were shared, that a lot of this is top down uh, directed towards the nurses. So we're looking at de-escalation training, anti-harassment, anti-oppression, anti-racism, inclusivity training, and cultural sensitivity training. Um, it's most definitely needed. Every worker should go into their job every day feeling like they belong, feeling like they're included, and also knowing 
that they have the supports and the recourse necessary if they do experience uh, any sort of oppression within the workplace. So now we're gonna pivot and do, we are going to do a few poll questions that Ainsworth is going to introduce. And I think Mark, I can stop my share and we can get into, okay, here we go. <laughs> so I'll, I will, um, as you can see in front of you, we have three poll questions. I'll read off the first one and then Ainsworth will take on the next two. So the first question is, do you support the creation of an inclusion an anti-oppression committee at your hospital that targets systemic barriers to equal opportunity while providing diversity and inclusion training. That relates specifically to the proposal we just presented. And Ainsworth? Sorry, uh, gender disparities in pay and employment advancement exist for women in the workplace. Would intentional change in policies, practices and decision-making increase disparity? and produce other unintended consequences? I guess the last question is, have you ever experienced or witnessed discrimination or racism at, at your hospital that was either explicit or subtle? All right, we, we'll give it a little bit longer. We got, the responses are rolling in. Just going to stop share. I don't think that'll impact anything. Fantastic. There we go. Give it 10 more. Oh, they're longer questions. Maybe give it a couple. Yeah, let's give it a little more seconds, right? Mm -hmm. Still coming in slow. And folks, folks just returned from lunch too, right? Yeah. yeah. Probably a little bit, uh, you know, probably feeling like me. Wants to go to bed. <laughs> Almost at half, almost at half. So that means um, half of you hasn't, haven't replied. That's what half means, right? <laughs> oh, forget silly Ainsworth. Okay, I, you know what we have, uh, we'll give it 10 more seconds. We're almost at a hundred responses. That's awesome. I mean, I know a lot of CIU staff are on the call as well. How do I, I don't know if, I don't know if it's possible to change an answer. Yeah, once you've taken the poll, unfortunately, you can't uh, change the response. Okay, so for the sake of time, I'm just going to start reading out the results uh, instead of I won't end the poll. Um, so seven, about almost 75% of those in attendance uh, voted. So 57% of you believe that this is important work and you want to be involved. 30% uh, believe it's important, but may not want to participate. 6% are indifferent to the proposal and 7% believe it's not a need at the workplace. And it's interesting, um, you know, some individuals may, may believe, you know, it doesn't exist at the workplace. And that, that also speaks to the fact that maybe you haven't been the one who have experienced it. So it's, it's uh, some uh, a lot of members who were on these focus groups said to us, listen, we, I've never experienced any of this, but then when they started talking to coworkers, they realized that some of the some of the issues that were existing in their workplace, and they'd never know, they're completely blind to it. And that was also um, motivation for joining the actual focus group to begin with. Ainsworth, you want, are, can you see the uh, other two questions and results? Oh yeah, I can. Yes, yes. So mm -hmm. I. If you'd like. Yeah. So so. Uh, 86% thinks that um, uh, policy practice and decision making would create more uh, more equality in the workplace. So that's 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 a good sign. 12% um, thought that uh, there would be other unintended consequences. It makes makes sense. And some folks thought that there would be no change. Uh, roughly 9%. Um, and for the last question, have you experienced or witnessed discrimination or racism at your at your workplace? Uh, 53 percent, sorry, 43, 49 percent says yes. I've experienced both. Uh, 23 percent says yes, but uh, mostly the subtle type. And 15 percent says sometimes. 13 percent says uh, never. So uh, make makes sense. It's in line with 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 what we found in in the research. So uh, thank you, folks, for uh, participating in this poll. 